As world leaders descend upon Manhattan for the UN General Assembly over the course of this week, we went straight to the source about what major topics this year's annual event will cover. Here's what Florencia Soto Nino, associate spokesperson at the UN, told me on Monday. We call it like a Super Bowl for diplomacy because we have um, over 195 world leaders descending in Manhattan uh, coming to headquarters. Uh, over 80 of them will be heads of state, including President Biden, uh, who will speak tomorrow at the General Assembly high-level debate. Uh, so it's very exciting. It's an opportunity for leaders to engage in person, uh, something they don't usually do. Every, everyone in the same building, in the same room, talking about the most pressing issues that we can address. And for the Secretary General, it's, um, it's kind of like he's the host, he's the one that brings them all together, and he tries to meet with as many of them as possible to have very honest and frank discussions about a lot of issues. How does the private sector tie in for us based here now at the New York Stock Exchange? Well, it's really interesting because you would think that the General Assembly uh, Week and the UN Week in general is only for governments, but more and more we have uh, been, been involving the private sector, also civil society and youth, uh, because there are important pieces in finding solutions for global challenges, right? So for example, we have what we call a global compact, which is a group of companies that have signed on to, um, to follow the sustainability principles, for example. And so they will be having their own summit here in New York. And so it's just a great mix of people. You will be walking down the corridors of the UN and you will see presidents, prime ministers, but also CEOs and activists and young people. So it's really very exciting. Certainly a lot in store. Talk to me more about the key issues that you anticipate to take center stage at this year's session. Well, as you know, the world right now is in a lot of turmoil. We have a lot of things happening, right? So. The, the conflicts all around the world obviously are going to take center stage, and I'm talking about Ukraine, the Middle East, Sudan, Myanmar. Um, these are all issues that are very pressing. Haiti as well, that the global community wants desperately to find solutions to. But also we have other issues that are sort of like the global commons, the sort of challenges that everybody faces, and we also need global solutions for that. That is climate change. Uh, obviously, there's a high-level event on rising sea levels. And for example, artificial intelligence is also another global challenge that um, leaders are keen to discuss. So all of these, there's also going to be an event on Afghanistan and inclusion of women in society. Um, so these are, these are all like topics that we will be we will be discussing for anyone based here in Manhattan we all know when the UN General Assembly is in session it's a very busy and exciting time certainly for Manhattan and really the entire world I saw some leaders making their way in fact to the city over the weekend and that was for the summit of the future what is that how does that tie into the UN uh, well first before talking about the summit of the future I want to apologize on behalf of the UN to all New Yorkers because we know that this is the week where traffic becomes really unbearable and I also want to thank um, the New York authorities and NYPD and everyone that makes that happen because really our cooperation with them is year-round but it's even more intense during this week so uh, thank you for your patience and uh, yeah the, so the summit of the future we actually started a little bit early uh, this year uh, this is the third day of the summit of the future uh, and it's quite interesting. It's it's it kind of it stands out from other General Assembly uh, high-level debate sessions because this is an event that the Secretary General Secretary General convened because he said, you know, this is something very interesting that he said. He said we cannot um, we are not fit to solve the problems of our grandchildren with the systems that were built by our grandparents. So he really wanted this summit to talk about all the problems, the new kind of problems that have come up since the UN was created, right, over 80 years ago. So these problems are things that are new and that we don't yet have the tools. We kind of know what we need to do, but we don't know how. So the Summit of the Future sought to address how are we going to tackle pandemics, the rise of artificial intelligence, autonomous weapons, climate change, um, 
and obviously other things that are quite important, such as Security Council reform. When the UN was created, it was the main powers after the Second World War that decided who would get permanent seats at the Council. And for example, Africa is not represented, it's never been represented. And so this is a step towards saying, you know, this needs to change, there needs to be a reform in the way we do things. And thankfully, yesterday, uh, countries agreed on the pact for the future, and today is the last day, and so it's a great way to kickstart the week. What does that pack entail? What are the takeaways from the Summit of the Future? There are actually quite a few. There's about over 50 concrete actions that countries agree to take. But I mentioned a few of them. So one of them is um, start uh, talking about Security Council reform, which is very important, um, to forming uh, a global body for governance of artificial intel intelligence. In terms of security, also, agreeing on using autonomous weapons and, and regulating that. How, how, how is that going to happen? Um, in, in the terms of online space, uh, addressing misinformation, addressing access for everyone, but also protecting children, for example, from harf harmful things on the internet. These are new issues, right? We were not dealing with this a few decades ago. In terms of climate, I think it's very tied to finance in the sense that a lot of the countries that don't contribute to climate change, that really have very little emissions, are the ones that are the most vulnerable, like Pacific Islands, islands in the Caribbean, small countries uh, that are really feeling the impacts of climate change and are very vulnerable and they need money. They need access to finance to adapt, to increase their resilience, to mitigate all the damages that uh, climate change is causing on their economies and it's not only the islands it's you know drought in Africa and the you know the global heat in many parts of the of the world including here in the United States